Welcome, everybody. Um, of course, we all know we're going to talk about a pediatric perspective on COVID-19 and children today. I do want to preface this with um, saying, as, as Dr. Meg Fisher always says, things are changing, um, you know, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. So some of these things that, that I wrote up within the last few days may be changing or may have changed recently. So please be aware of that always. Um, and I'm welcome, you know, I welcome any questions that you may have. And even after there's, if you have questions, you can always uh, submit them by email. Thank you. There we go. Okay. So we're going to talk about the timeline of, of what COVID is and when it started. Um, back in December of 2019, China reported a case of pneumonia of unknown origin. Um, and by December 31st, WHO was notified about this and, and uh, took it upon themselves to investigate. Uh, January 2020, um, novel coronavirus was identified in China, but the first U.S. case was identified in January of 2020 um, out on the West Coast. SARS-CoV-2 declared a U.S. public health emergency also in January of 2020. In February of 2020, uh, test kits became available for COVID-19. We were able to test specifically for the coronavirus um, that causes the SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this was rolled out in, in February of 2020. In March of 2020, SARS-CoV-2 was declared a pandemic uh, by WHO. A nationwide emergency was declared in the United States um, and CDC was part of that. The schools started closing in March of 2020 and generally the public became aware of uh, an issue um, that was called COVID-19 um, by CDC. Uh, and how important and how widespread this was. April of 2020, racial disparities in COVID deaths were recognized. Um, cases of severe inflammatory syndrome related to COVID infections were recognized in children in the UK. Uh, and thereafter, uh, the CDC also recognized that in the United States. In May of 2020, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, also called MISC, was recognized by the CDC and it was given a name. Um, and the U.S. deaths at, in May of 2020 had already crossed 100,000. By December of 2020, um, we were able to get the first vaccine approved for age 16 and older by Pfizer. Um, thereafter, Moderna also um, soon after got, got its approval uh, for the mRNA vaccine that they had produced. In 2021, CDC said, 140,000 children of age 0 to 17 lost a parent, custodial grandparent, or a care guardian caregiver to COVID-19. Um, that's just to tell you how widespread this was and how serious uh, um, the situation is to um, the social uh, to the social network uh, in our in our uh, country. Recognition that vaccinated patients were less likely to develop COVID-related illness compared to unvaccinated persons, um, and a number of studies thereafter have re-emphasized this finding, and we have seen this going back um, all the way to the beginning of, of this, um, uh, of our being able to vaccinate people. It's that vaccinated persons were less likely to develop serious illness, hospitalization, and death compared to unvaccinated person. And that's not to say that it doesn't happen or it's at zero. I'm sure everybody's heard stories, um, but, but the important thing to remember is that as a, as a vaccine, when we, we give somebody a vaccine, uh, we understand that it's never 100% affected. Um, the point is to make sure that we can get to a point where somebody who's vaccinated doesn't get as sick as somebody who's not vaccinated, uh, and it's able to uh, mute the response uh, in such a way that our mortality rates are significantly less. Again, in 2021, April, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech approved uh, for ages 12 to 17. In November of 2021, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine approved for ages 5 to 11, which is where we are today. So it's important to remember that we've all talked about COVID variants. There's uh, some talk about a new variant every single day, if not every single week. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 SARS undergoes mutations or changes frequently uh, and thereby creates a new variant. The variants that we have um, been talking about and recognized so far are Omicron, which is the latest. It was first identified in South Africa. It spreads more easily than other variants. Um, but the important thing to remember is that we feel that this, um, uh, this 
variant uh, causes less severity of disease and less mortality uh, than the previous variants did. The gamma was developed was discovered in November of 2020 uh, in Brazil. It increased the hospitalizations rate and there was a significant mortality rate in Brazil because of this. The Delta variant was first identified in India. Uh, it's, it spread more easily than other variants and became a huge issue across the world, uh, locking down a lot of countries. The severity um, we know was quite severe uh, than other variants and mortality rate was still significant with this variant. The beta was discovered in South Africa in May of 2020, it continued to be very virulent, but um, somehow short-lived. The alpha was discovered in the UK in September 2020, but there was a high transmiss transmissibility and mortality, and of course this was um, the talk of town uh, for, for quite a bit of 2020. <clears throat> We're going to talk specifically about children and pediatric illness in COVID. Um, so let, let's get started with that. Though children tend not to get as sick as COVID-19 as adults, some children can become severely ill with COVID-19. We know that back in 2020 and early 2021, um, there was a lot of talk about how this does not affect children, so we don't need to worry about a vaccine for kids. Um, and schools can be open, it really isn't going to spread there, we don't need to do anything about it. Um, that unfortunately is not true. Um, although children tend not to get as sick from COVID-19 as adults, some do. They may need hospitalization, they need to be treated in intensive care sometimes, placed on a ventilator to help them breathe. Um, and, and this is, we've seen this across the years. Um, and of course, in 2022, we're still seeing a lot of children getting sick from COVID-19. According to the AAP or the American Academy of Pediatrics and Children's Hospital Association, children represented about 16% of all COVID-19 cases in the United States. COVID-19 in children has been on the rise in the United States, with children making up 24% of just over 100,000 weekly reported cases of COVID-19 in 2022. Of the children admitted to the hospital for COVID-related <coughs> illnesses, about one in three are admitted to the pediatric ICU. So that goes to, say, to show you how severe this illness can be in those kids who are admitted to the hospital. Disparities amongst children. Research also suggested disproportionately higher rates of COVID-19 in Hispanic and non-Hispanic black children than in non-Hispanic white children. And of course, you know, we said that back in 2020 itself, we recognized that this was true across the uh, community also. Disparities among children, babies under the age of one might be at a higher risk of severe illness than older children. Um, it is possible that this is due to their immature immune systems and smaller airways, um, because this is a respiratory illness. We know that the smaller the airway, the more at risk these children are for developing respiratory distress, which makes them more, develop, more likely to develop breathing issues. Some of the signs and symptoms of COVID-19, um, and this is in no way uh, a complete list. Um, it usually presents with children having a fever, fatigue, um, having no energy to do anything, just lying there, headaches, myalgia or muscle pain, a cough, diarrhea, runny nose, sore throat, abdominal pain, and shortness of breath. So although in adults, we saw a lot of respiratory illness in children, as you can see, some of the symptoms have nothing to do with breathing. They could be diarrhea, runny nose, abdominal pain, um, or just a sore throat. And that we're seeing a lot of now with the Omicron variant too. So in, um, early on uh, in 2020, when um, COVID-19 became an issue, um, there was a description in a lot of literature about a uh, condition um, which presents in children usually about you know two to six weeks after um, COVID was exposed, where the child was exposed to COVID or a COVID infection was developed, that they came down with a condition um, somewhat similar to Kawasaki syndrome, which was a well-known condition in children um, and results in cardiac um, uh, cardiac morbidities. Um, and this was recognized um, as a separate entity um, back in the spring of 2020. 
So by the spring of 2020, the CDC recognized it as a separate entity and called it MISC or multi-system inflammatory uh, condition in children. So the question arises, if children don't frequently experience severe illness with COVID-19, why do they need a COVID vaccine? So first of all, like I said, children get sick and even one child getting sick and needing to be hospitalized into the ICU with severe um, illness um, is enough to want us to, to prevent this. The vaccine can prevent a child from getting and spreading COVID-19. Uh, and we know this is true. Um, although there was a lot of talk about how children cannot spread it and maybe they don't spread it, so we don't need to close down the schools. Um, we know that it can, they can spread it and um, the vaccine can prevent a child from getting and spreading COVID-19. If a child does get COVID-19, the vaccine can prevent him or her from becoming severely ill or experiencing complications. And like I said, no vaccine is 100% effective in preventing the disease or the infection, but we do want to get to the point, and we have gotten to the point with COVID-19 where the vaccine does prevent them from getting severely ill and reduces the mortality rates uh, in, in, all the, in, in everybody that is eligible to get the vaccine. So the COVID-19 vaccines, COVID vaccines that are approved in the United States at this point are ages 5 through 11. The US FDA has given emergency use authorization to the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for this group. This is the only vaccine that has been approved for this group at this date. It contains a lower dose than the version used for the 12 and older or the adult version. Research shows that this vaccine is about 91% effective in preventing COVID-19 um, in children ages five through 11 uh, and serious illnesses. COVID-19 approved for kids ages 12 through 15. Um, the FDA gave emergency use authorization to the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine again for this age group. It contained the same dose as the vaccine for the ages 16 and older or the adult dose. And the research showed that this vaccine was 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 in children ages 12 through 15. <clears throat> the FDA has approved a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 uh, vaccine also called Comirnaty for the age group 16 and older. This received full approval um, of the FDA. It's not just an emergency use authorization anymore. Uh, and that's why this has a brand name now. This vaccine is 91% effective again in children, in, in everybody that receives the vaccine uh, or both doses of this vaccine uh, and, it, and preventing severe illness with COVID-19 in people age 16 and older. So the important thing to rem remember is that when we're talking about effectiveness of 91%, it's after having received both doses of this vaccine and two weeks after having received that second dose. How the RNA vaccines um, work, basically it's, it's, this is just a um, illustration showing that the vaccine is based on part of the COVID-19 genetic code or RNA that tells the cells what to produce. When the patient is injected with the vaccine, it enters the cells and tells them to produce a corona spike protein. So we are not introducing the, the virus itself. Um, so there is no chance of developing uh, COVID-19 from the vaccine itself. Uh, the antibodies and the T cells are produced this produces um, immune system to produce antibodies and to activate the T cells ready to destroy infected cells. If the patient gets COVID-19 or is infected with the COVID-19, um, antibodies and T cells are automatically triggered to fight the virus. COVID-19 vaccines were developed using science that has been around for decades. It's not a new method to develop a vaccine. And the only reason we were able to get this vaccine developed within that year after we first found COVID, the coronavirus um, that caused COVID-19 is basically because we already had the technology to do this. Um, so the mRNA technology is not new. It was also used in, in the development of the Ebola virus vaccine, uh, which also we know has been effective. So this is not new. Um, so if you hear somebody say it's, it's a new technology and we don't know, you know how to do this, that's not true. We do know how, how it should be done and how it works. Um, it's just that this vaccine for this particular illness um, is something new. COVID-19 vaccines are safe, much safer than getting the COVID-19. We know this. 
Um, it's been shown that people who get the vaccine are less likely to develop significant serious illness requiring hospitalization and a decrease in the mortality rates. COVID-19 vaccines are effective at preventing severe illness from COVID-19 and the spread of the virus that causes it also. Safety in the 5 to 11 year olds was studied in approximately 3,100 children ages 5 to 11 who received the vaccine and no serious side effects were detected in that group. As research here, studies are continuing in the six months to the four year age group. We know that over the last couple of weeks, there have been um, uh, some talk about this and, it, and it's been confusing. Um, it's just that Pfizer-BioNTech did submit an application for approval for emergency use authorization in uh, the younger age group um, to the FDA, um, but even they came out saying that they did not feel that it was effective enough in this age group, uh, and that's why they are continuing that study with a third dose, and the FDA has also asked them to resubmit the data um, so they can um, reevaluate it over the next, next few months. The booster dose or a third dose um, five to six months after the second dose has been approved for the mRNA vaccines, both uh, Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna. Um, and that's something that has been shown to be effective in, again, decreasing the spread of the, the virus and decrease in hospitalization and the severity of the illness. Among 8.9 million adolescents vaccinated during the study period, VAERS or this is the Vaccine Adverse Effects Reporting System. Reports were received for approximately one per thousand vaccines, uh, vaccinees or people, and 90% of these reports were for non-serious conditions. Um, so this is something that everybody, it, the, the various system is open to everybody to, to report, um, and it does not matter if the um, uh, side effect or the adverse effect was mild or severe, um, uh, all pediatricians and physicians are instructed in reporting these, um, so hopefully most of them did get reported. Syncope and fainting was among the events most commonly reported, uh, reported in VAERS in this age group and is common amongst adolescents after any vaccination. Um, and if you ask pediatricians, they'll tell you that, you know, that this is not an uncommon reaction amongst teenagers. Amongst the serious reports of myocarditis and other conditions that might be associated with myocarditis were amongst the most common terms reported. And myocarditis specifically means an inflammation of the heart muscle. Uh, and this is something that we have seen um, not only with the vaccine, but also with the disease. Uh, and there is, a, there is a difference in the way that these present between the disease and, and um, the vaccine. Um, we have seen that with myocarditis from the COVID disease itself, it's much more severe, lasts much longer, um, and these children end up in the ICU for a longer time. The myocarditis that's secondary to the vaccine itself usually occurred within a short time after the vaccine was administered within a few days, and most often it lasted for less than 72 hours, and these kids are covered um, usually with most significant um, long-term sequelae. The death count from COVID-19 has crossed 800,000 uh, in 2022. The only deaths causally related to the vaccine have occurred following the J&J &J vaccine that resulted in a syndrome known as TTS. A cardiac, <clears throat> which is basically a, a, a bleeding problem. A cardiac side effects from the vaccine known as myocarditis have been seen following mRNA vaccines and usually are short-lived and not associated with long-term complications. So side effects of the vaccine, um, any injection has side effects. All vac almost all vaccines have um, side effects. There's usually a mild and temporary side effect which may occur, which could be pain at the injection site, which happens with any injections, fatigue or tiredness, headaches. Um, less common symptoms could be fever, chills, and joint pain uh, associated with the vaccine, um, and usually lasts about 24 to 48 hours after the vaccine is given. So, you know, everybody's heard about the myths and the TikTok videos and, and what's been going on with, um, you know, with, with this. So I just want to address some of those issues um, at this point. So there's a saying that getting a COVID-19 vaccine can make you magnetic. Not true. 
COVID-19 vaccines can affect your DNA. Also not true, the vaccine material never enters your cells, so cannot affect your DNA. Again, we're not introducing um, uh, the virus either, so there's no way for it to spread. COVID-19 vaccines affect fertility. Um, when we first um, came across co coronavirus and COVID-19, um, there was a lot of information out there because we did not know better. Uh, nobody ever said that it does affect fertility, but all the OBs and, and physicians basically said that we don't know. Um, so that went on for about a year till a lot of studies came out, um, especially with case reports where um, women got the vaccine when they were pregnant and not, did not know they were uh, pregnant and following them through their um, pregnancy um, ended up giving us enough data to show that it does not affect fertility um, and it does not affect the, the, the unborn child either. COVID-19 vaccines aren't recommended for pregnant people, not true. Um, the American College of Obstetric and Gynecology is recommending that women get the vaccine at any time during their pregnancy. There have been known, significantly known side effects to the vaccine um, occurring in the unborn child. You can still get COVID-19 after you receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Absolutely true. Um, we have coined a term for this, calling it breakthrough. Um, and we see this a lot, especially we saw it a lot with Omicron, the variant. Um, but we can also tell you that if you had the vaccine, the chances of you getting much sicker are definitely less. Um, so having had the vaccine um, and both, both doses at least um, significantly reduces the chance of hospitalization and severe illness. Long-term side effects of COVID-19 vaccines are common. Um, yes, there are conditions known as, um, uh, as the long effects of, of COVID-19. Of COVID um, uh, and long COVID, but it's not common. It's quite uncommon. Um, if anything, it may be rare, um, but the point is that important to remember that long-term side effects of COVID-19 vaccines are not common. You don't need a COVID-19 vaccine if you're young and healthy. We know this is not true. We thought, you know, a lot of people were talking about this in 2020 saying if you're young and you're healthy and you're in school you really don't need it because you're not going to spread it you're not going to get it but we know that's not true um children get it um children get, end up in the icu and children can get sick from this so it's not true that if you're young and healthy you don't need the vaccine the aap recommends covid 19 vaccine for all children and adolescents five years of age and older who do not have contraindications using a COVID-19 vaccine authorized for the use for their age. And at this point, the only one that is, is the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine. These are some of the resources that um, I would suggest um, you go to um, for more information. Um, the CDC.gov, the FDA.gov, the COVID-19NJ.gov is the is the State Department of Health in New Jersey that has up-to-date information and keeps updating the information all the, all the time. And AAP.org is the American Academy of Pediatrics.org where pediatricians go to for their information and that's how we spread um, the information amongst us and amongst the peers. Um, I'll throw it open for questions now. Anybody have questions? And you can unmute yourself if you need to ask a question or put it in the chat. Hi, how are you? Hi. How, how do we know um, as far as infertility for um, children that it's there is no long-term effect? Is it just that we're looking at the current research saying that it's none right so I mean, there, are, there, are, there, are no, there are no long-term effects to the we already know that even the antibodies um after a time are decreasing um so if 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 it was to happen we would expect it more short term only because these are 
um, the, the vaccine itself has its effect only for, for a shorter duration. We know which is why boosters are recommended because we know that the antibodies decrease significantly um, in, in most of the people who got the shot. Um, if you're asking for a guarantee, there is none because we don't know. Um, but the point is that we do know that in the short term, within the, within the last couple of years, we, we've been following this, um, that it has no effects on, on pregnancy.